This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Welcome to StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Richard Walter, is a screenwriter, author of best-selling fiction and nonfiction, celebrated storytelling educator, associate dean, entertainment industry expert, and longtime professor and chairman of the celebrated, highly regarded graduate screenwriting program at the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. His books include the novels Escape from Film School and Barry and the Persuasions. His nonfiction titles include The Whole Picture, Strategies for Screenwriting Success in the New Hollywood, Screenwriting, the Art, Craft, and Business of Film and Television Writing, and most recently, Essentials of Screenwriting. His books have been translated into eight languages. Richard has written numerous feature assignments for the major studios, including the earliest drafts of American Graffiti, and has sold material to all the major broadcast networks. He's also written many informational, educational, and corporate films. He lectures on screenwriting and storytelling throughout the world, including conducting master classes throughout North America and such cities as London, Paris, Jerusalem, Madrid, Rio, Mexico City, Beijing, Sydney, and Hong Kong. Writers who have studied at UCLA have written dozens of prestige independent productions as well as Hollywood blockbusters, including 11 projects for Steven Spielberg. His former students have won five Best Screenplay Oscar nominations and three Oscars in just the past seven years. In fact, Richard has probably influenced more great screenwriters than any other screenwriting teacher ever. The Wall Street Journal calls him the prime broker for Hollywood's hottest commodity, new writing talent. Richard is also a pop culture critic and media pundit who's appeared multiple times on the Today Show, The O'Reilly Factor, Hardball, ABC Primetime, Scarborough Country, and CBS News Nightwatch, to name a few. And as if he doesn't have enough on his plate, Richard is also a court-authorized expert in intellectual property litigation. If at the end of this chat you want to know more about Richard, please visit www.richardwalter.com. Well, I'm proud beyond words to say that a few years ago I had the great good fortune to be one of Richard's students while I was attending UCLA's exceptional screenwriting program. So I'm humbled and honored to have the legendary Richard Walter as my guest on StoryBeat today. Richard, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Could you read that introduction uh, again? Uh, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, Steve. Uh, it just sounded so like a description of some other guy, you know. Uh, you, you, I, feel, I feel really uh, like a lazy <laughs> man. I really do. I'm up at the crack of nine thirty, you know, on a on a busy day, and um, I know when I look back, I um, I see that I have done a lot, but it doesn't feel like I'm doing that. And I think that's sort of like like writing, you know, uh, when you're actually lost in the process, that that zone that writers get into, and they don't get into it easily. Um, you know, the time just seems to fly by. And, I, uh, I love you know, being in that zone. There's nothing better yeah, than being in that then zone. Then you look back. You really don't realize it until you look back. Well, that's ab- absolutely true. So, uh, here, f- first question for you today. You you've obviously been teaching for quite some time. What would you say are the common mistakes that novice screenwriters make that you see on a regular basis? Well, the biggest mistake all writers make, including uh, the writer who's talking to you right now, is we write too much. There's just too much language, too many words. Movies are too long. There's too much dialogue, too much description. Uh, that is the single biggest error that that uh, that people make. I would say, with regard to uh, to screen plays in particular, among the uh, you know the excesses of of language that you see that give away a, a script as uh, being written by an amateur, and there's nothing wrong with being an amateur. It means a lover. We've all seen Amadeus. Yes. Um, but what we want, we want most writers I deal with, and certainly everybody at UCLA wants to be a professional, not an amateur, but a, uh, a, a 
a, a professional. And maybe make a few bucks, right? When you're reading uh, a screenplay, certain uh, non-professional aspects of it, especially stuff that doesn't deal with sight and sound. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Harry realizes that he left the gun in the drawer by the uh, nightstand in the motel. What do you mean realizes? What, what does that look like? Uh, also, um, uh, among the excesses of language that I think give away a, a writer as being not really an, an experienced, fully formed professional is uh, descriptions of, of um, uh, characters' gestures, facial expressions, um, pauses, and, and stuff like that. Those Acting. are real giveaways of, um, as I say, a uh, kind of an amateurism. It's a, the, you're, where writers are indicating acting where it's not necessary to do so. Correct. I like to say action, yes. Acting, no. Yes. The uh, character, character does something... Uh, if she's doing it, uh, if you're if you're reporting it as the writer, if you're reporting it in the script, then it should be a piece of essential action. That is to say, it should be something that, if it were not there, the script, uh, the scene, uh, whatever it is, would make no sense. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that's what it's, the job is of a writer is to is to tell the of a screenwriter tell the action and the uh, the dialogue, what happens and uh, what the uh, you know what the people do and what they what they say. Acting, on the other hand, has to do with uh, beats, pauses, as I, as I said earlier. I'll see lots of ellipses in, um, uh, in, in dialogue, for example, indicating a kind of a hesitancy or something like that. You know, Shakespeare stumbled through 36 or 37 <laughs> plays without ever uh, doing anything like that, without ever using a symbol single not one instance of using a parenthetical you know melancholy you never you never see any in, anything like that in uh, in shakespeare it's just not necessary and it's a good example of, of writers making that common mistake you asked me about which is writing too much too much yeah i as you as you know i'm i've just completed my sixth year as a teacher here in pittsburgh and congratulations thank you and um you're uh, gaining on me i'm just finishing up year 40 pretty soon you'll be uh, is that all I'll be looking looking forward to you. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, you know, it'll take me a while to catch up, if ever. <laughs> um, and so I see, a, you know, a lot of what I now see on a daily basis are things that you um, pounded into us and harped on a lot, which I, I'm grateful that I, I had all that education because I now see it from that perspective. I'm not having to figure it out on my own. You actually gave it to us, which is great. So in, beyond getting script mechanics right, which, you know, that takes a little bit of time to get that craft down, um, what must a screenwriter do to secure even a chance at a sale? What do we have to do in our storytelling? Well, the first thing you have to do, the first thing we have to do is, uh, is sort of just what you said, that is to say, we, we have to realize that it's just what you said. It is storytelling. It's all about story. It's not about mood. It's not about the texture and tone. Um, it's, it's about story. Now, some people will say that it's, it, what about character? Isn't it really about character? Well, character is story. I don't think you can separate character from story. What is a character except what the, uh, uh, the sum total of the character's actions and, and lines of dialogue uh, uh, add up to. Uh, to ask somebody <clears throat> whether or not, um, as I'm asked all the time, uh, you know, what's more important, character or story? It's like asking, uh, what's more important to you, your heart or your lungs? You know? <laughs> they, uh, they just don't work independently, one, one from the other. There was a um, member of our faculty who uh, writes with a partner, and a, uh, somebody um, asked him, to, so how does that work? You write the uh, dialogue and he writes the, uh, the action as, as, if, as if you could do that, you know. Uh, uh, you write the story, he writes the characters. Um, it just doesn't work like that. It doesn't, doesn't uh, break apart. A, a so that's what, actors, what, what writers really need to, to focus upon is story. This happens, that happens, something happens after that. And every single thing that happens has to both resolve something and yet at the same time open up uh, new tensions. Mm -hmm. It's a tall order. It's hard to do. That's why they pay us so much when they pay us at all. Is, would you say that story and plot are the same thing? I, do, I would, I, I, and, I, and I, indeed I do. Um, 
Uh, it's funny you mentioned in, in the description of, of me uh, that I do um, a lot of expert witnessing in uh, intellectual property litigation. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, I'm reminded that in uh, intellectual property litigation, there is something that they call, there are two tests. I've never really figured them out. One is called the extrinsic test, and one is called the intrinsic test. But they have to do with various elements within a screenplay. Do they... Uh, uh, bear uh, substantial or striking similarities and so on, trying to figure out if one was stolen from the other, is based upon the other. And um, some judge somewhere, you know, everybody's an expert on screenwriting, he just made up this list. <laughs> and one of them, uh, two of the elements are not story, but one is called plot, and the other is called sequence of events. Well, I've been writing for about half a century professionally, <laughs> and I've been teaching for uh, uh, 40 years uh, I thought <laughs> I thought sequence of events is plot. I thought plot is sequence of events. Me I too. Think plot, story, sequence of events are all the same thing. It's just a recounting of the stuff that happens, what the characters do and what they say. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and I like to teach that plot is story and story is plot. And you can't do anything. Exactly what you just said, that you can't really have any of, any of it without characters, certainly in conflict with other characters. Right. Um, well, sometimes I, I will, for the sake of the court, decide that the the plot really uh, involves, the, um, the, you know, the story is the stuff that's actually in the movie. The plot is, is the stuff that's in the movie and also the stuff that, we, that a viewer could infer following that and preceding all of that. But what, what value is there in that? I, I don't see too much uh, value in that. Well, none unless you're doing a sequel or a prequel. Right, right. And I, um, you know, the, the, the problem with Hollywood today is prequels and sequels. I Everything agree. is a prequel, a sequel. I a, agree. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a remake, a, um, a reboot, uh, you know, a new, fran a new chapter in a franchise, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, unfortunately, very little originality. Okay, so over the years, as you've been teaching all of all of everything that you teach, and you do teach a lot of different things, um, would you say that from the beginning of your, you know, 40 years ago when you started to teach, would you say that your approach to teaching has changed, and if so, how? It really hasn't changed terribly much at all. Uh, I, um, uh, my, <clears throat> my classes, <clears throat> excuse me, grow out of um, my own experiences as a screenwriting student, not at uh, UCLA, but another film school here in Los Angeles across town. I just can't remember the name of it right now. Would it have anything to do with the Trojan? <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> by the way, by the uh, way, we're both alumni of that school. Well, we 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 can say it. We're talking about USC, and indeed, mm -hmm. it was a uh, you know talk about right place, right time, and and talk about looking back. I didn't realize it at the time, but um, uh, it, it, you know here it was the mid to late '60s, and I fell into film school. Uh, and my classmates, you know, <laughs> would go on to own Hollywood, except for one who owns Marin County. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, Mr. Um, Lucas. The, uh, yeah, well, it's fun. I remember I came to California, I thought, for three weeks in August of 1966. And three years later, in August of 69, my wife and I uh, were taking a, just a motor holiday up, up uh, along the coast all the way to the Oregon uh, border. And we stopped in San Francisco, and I had... Um, brunch with 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 uh, there were nine of us including my wife and, I, and me um and those uh, the other seven included george lucas and his wife at the time marcia darling darling woman indeed we stayed overnight with them on, on our way a, back a great editor uh john melius uh, you know the the giant uh, action adventure maven sure author also of course of apocalypse now and on and on and on. Um, Caleb Deschanel, the uh, celebrated cinematographer who's probably more famous now uh, for his daughters, who <laughs> are, sure. um, you know, stars of stage and screen. Um, he was there with Dave Lester, less known name, but he was a, Dave was, was a producer and produced um, many of uh, Ron Shelton's movies, uh, Bull Durham and stuff like that. Um, I think that was Shelton. I'm pretty sh pretty sure that was Shel that was Ron uh, Walter Shelton. Walter Murch, a world famous guy, a sound yeah. uh, editor and designer who actually won two Oscars the same year. 
uh, and has a book out right now. There's a book out called, uh, with his, not written by Walter, but about Walter. Walter Murch's name is in the title. He um, is a uh, kind of a, a uh, an amateur expert on um, oh cosmology, uh, you know physics, uh, uh, you know the 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 uh, theoretical mathematics and stuff like that. A most remarkable guy, and and his wife uh, Aggie, a, a sweet sweet woman. I think that adds up all to all to nine. So again, right time, right place. Uh, I just suddenly was surrounded by by tremendously talented, ambitious people, and it was the right time in the movie business because people were. Um, uh, left over at, 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 time, at that time from this silent era, if you could imagine such a thing. Um, people making movies were generally very old. People watching movies, audiences were very young, and they were starting to uh, uh, integrate new, fresh voices into the uh, industry. And um, it, was a, it was a great time to, to be in film school and to be in Hollywood. Well, I think that, uh, you know, that would be, I can't even imagine that. I mean, I've certainly been around a famous person or two, but that seems like a, just an awesome table to be around. Would well, you... of course, at the time, it was just a bunch of old school, <laughs> old school pals having, having brunch in Sausalito. Was know, this before Star Wars, Richard? I'm sorry? Was this before Star Wars? Yes, this, well, this was, um, oh, well, this is 1969. Star Wars comes out in 77. Oh, I wow. April. So uh, this is before even American Graffiti. Oh, wow. This is before American Graffiti. Yes, I think it was. I'll tell you what, uh, as I realize it now, because when, when Pat and I, Pat is my bride, um, we, uh, uh, when we stayed at George's house on the way back down, I remember uh, that he was cutting THX, the Warner Brothers feature-length version of his uh, shorter student right, film. Right, right. He was cutting it actually in his attic. He had uh, uh, built himself an editing uh, room up there. So this is after the shooting, the the uh, uh, production of THX, his first feature film. And, um, you know, before the release of the movie, he was doing post. He was cutting the, the movie at that time. So it was before even American Graffiti. Graffiti would not happen, uh, you know, for another, would, would not get started as a deal for another year or two. So it's quite a little, quite a little ways to, ago. And, and you had something to do with the early drafts of American Graffiti, correct? Well, I did indeed. I wrote the first two drafts of the uh, screenplays for American Graffiti. Uh, George um, had originally had really wanted to work with um, another classmate of ours, whose name was Willard Hike. Oh yeah, very talented guy. Um, Willard was uh, his girlfriend, now his longtime wife, Gloria Katz. Uh, who's also his writing partner. Um, she was a student actually at UCLA. They met at a Roger Corman lecture somewhere in town. And um, they were very close with, with George, much closer with George than I was. And uh, George had really wanted to work with them on graffiti, but they weren't available. And uh, so he came to, to me, and I wrote a couple of drafts. At, uh, it was actually a United Artists project at that time. Um, George has sweetly, uh, generously complimented my work over the years in interviews. However, uh, he he did not like the script for a couple of reasons. One was uh, it was just too unlike his uh, you know experience growing up in Modesto. Hey, I'm a Jew from Queens, you know. <laughs> I grew up in New York. We didn't know anything about cars and stuff like that. And I wasn't kidding anybody. I think people pretty knew pretty well knew that about me. I think you know you come out from New York to California, and you kind of try to let everybody know you're from New York. You know, I think I would get more of a New York accent when I, uh, when I was here uh, <laughs> uh, than I had previously, or I like the things that I, that I have now. And the other thing George didn't like, uh, you know, if you, if you look at George's work, uh, there's not a lot of sex in it. It's pretty clinical, uh, you know, saran-wrapped um, stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a lusty uh, guy writing about um, teenage adolescence and um, so on. Uh, that's a, a uh, you know, hormone-charged moment in a life. And, I, you know, my version uh, of American Graffiti did have some, some raunchy uh, uh, sexual stuff in it. And uh, that was at a time also that movies were opening up and more open to, uh, uh, you know, more graphic depictions of such activity. And George really hated all of that. He's just very, very uncomfortable with all of that. I think that's 
pretty obvious to anybody who's yes. seen any of his other movies. It's very obvious. Um, and in the interim, so it, so he decided to, to write his own drafts for graffiti, and uh, that is to say, his own draft. Well, maybe he wrote a couple of drafts, and uh, he submitted those to United Artists, and United Artists passed on the project. Uh, they just declined to make the movie. Um, Francis Ford Coppola resurrected the deal at Universal. Uh, Francis was nominally the uh, producer of the film, and by the time that uh, Universal was ready to um, get going with the project, Willard and Gloria were available, and so they ended up uh, writing uh, a number of drafts. They and George have credit on the picture. I do not. Uh, screen credit. Uh, the credit is George Lucas, and then the word and, A-N-D, and then the the names Willard Hike and Gloria Katz connected by an ampersand. Yeah, percent, but, sure. Um, that might not mean a lot to the public, but to the uh, movie business people, it means that George had first position and 50% of the credit, and Willard and Gloria had second position, and um, uh, they shared, the two of them, 50% of the credit, 25% each. Um, uh, as people in the movie business know, there there's nothing unusual about a lot of people uh, being hired to write uh, on a movie, and not all of them getting credit. Credit is a, a judgment, ultimately, uh, not of the producer or the writer or anybody else, but the Writers Guild, which does a, uh, in a case like Graffiti, where you have a production executive, in this case, the uh, pr the director, George, um, seeking credit, there's an automatic arbitration, an anonymous panel um, weighs all of the material, comes up with, every, with, with whatever judgments they uh, came up with, and that's the judgment that the uh, they came up with. I was well paid for the work I did. There's no controversy about it. Uh, George doesn't tell it any differently. Um, Willard and Gloria don't don't tell it any differently. Um, I was well enough paid. You know, they made much much more money than I did, but I have all the money that I need. What's the difference? How much money you, ha you have above what you need? You know. Right. And um, the uh, uh, the truth is that the draft of graffiti that I wrote, the uh, the two drafts. In particular, the second draft, I think, got me a lot of work uh, in Hollywood. I wrote a, uh, I became, it seemed like, the go-to guy for uh, loss of innocence, adolescent coming of age, rite of passage kinds of kind of movies. So, so you became, for a while, pigeonholed into that sort of genre. Yeah, well, I didn't mind it. I, you know, I was uh, still a pretty young writer and writing about my uh, my own coming of age. Uh, indeed, my first uh, book was a novel, Barry and the Persuasions, which is a New York adolescent kind of coming of age. And in fact, I, I tried to talk George out of American Graffiti when he, when he um, approached me. I said, uh, you know, who cares about your Gentile white bread, <laughs> uh, the, the sugar-frosted mode flake, Modesto, you know, uh, 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 you know, growing up, let's do New York. Let's do kids <laughs> singing doo-wop in the streets and so on. Um, now there's an old joke. There's a joke about Hollywood. I hope it's okay to get a little vulgar. Oh, please do. I haven't. We have an adult rating on this show okay. and everything. <laughs> the, the joke is, how do you say "fuck you" in Hollywood? And the traditional punchline is, "Trust me." <laughs> uh, but uh, there's another punchline, which is, "Let's we'll we'll do that project after this project." You know, after we do this project, which is what George was saying about my own bearing the persuasions. Now, please understand. I, I didn't believe that George had any, any obligation to, to make my movie. He wanted to make his movie, of course. But I do take a kind of dark pride in, ha in having a, attempted to talk him out of um, what is one of the you know, great, great, great movies. Uh, it was one of the original 25 to be entered into the federal government's um, then brand new registry of film classics. Um, my goodness, uh, I haven't met one single soul who hasn't seen American Graffiti and didn't think, uh, well of it, and here I am trying try to talk George Lucas <laughs> out of it. Not too seriously. I did not think he was going to go. Uh, I did not think he was going to go along with my uh, my plea. Did, did and by the way, uh, you know, subsequently, Barry and the Persuasions was uh, published as a novel. At that time, it was uh, in the form just of a an elaborate film treatment. Uh, it would go on. I would uh, go on to use it as a uh, model, uh, no uh, an outline for a novel, which did sell quite quickly and then the rights were bought by a, the film rights were bought by a major studio and I uh, ended up doing the adaptation assignment unfortunately the film remains uh, waiting to be made but in the interim I've also turned it into a, um, a stage musical 
a jukebox musical Isn't story about right? Jersey boys. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, trying to move it in, in that direction. I only mention this because uh, here's something I scro- scrolled out, you know, now over 40 years ago, and I'm still in business with the thing. Uh, writers often um, believe that, uh, you know, in a script, they write a script that doesn't sell, that's the end of it. But it's not the end of it. It's really just the beginning of it. There are all kinds of rewards that can accrue, that can flow from the uh, script that is uh, unsold. For one thing, it may sell years later. Uh, Clint Eastwood um, made a movie uh, on a script that was uh, based on... on, uh, Unforgiven. Yeah, um, that's right. And that won the Oscar for Best Movie, Best Screenplay. 20 years. Uh, Melvin Webb, what's his name? No, David Uh, Webb Peoples. David Webb Peoples. That script was around for decades before Clint actually did it. But even shy of that, and by the way, Clint also made another movie that Clint made uh, that he had at, at Malpaso, his company, for over 10 years, was uh, in the line of fire, the, the one about the, uh, the, the secret, the secret service guy takes yeah. the bullet for the president. Um, so, the, you know, when the script does his sell it, right away it still may sell eventually. But beyond that, there's all kinds of stuff that, that happens uh, uh, after that. Uh, all sorts of rewards. You can end up with a rewrite assignment. You can end up with a development deal. Um, uh, uh, you'll certainly end up a better writer. You'll have more in inventory and so on. And, and uh, I just cite that as an example in my own career with Barry and the Persuasions. So, that's just one example. In regard to Barry and the Persuasions, I want to go back to your notion of sex and George Lucas not you know, being comfortable with it. Um, was there much more raunch and sex in Barry and the Persuasions? Yeah, as a matter of fact... Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing uh, at my own cleverness here. God forgive me. Um, I had originally, when I wrote Baron Dissuasions, there was a, an early sex scene uh, under the boardwalk at Coney Island uh, where uh, our protagonist, Barry, has his initiation into the uh, world of lovemaking. And it's a really raunchy, uh, rather express, explicit sexual scene. Um, and... Uh, uh, it came rather early in the uh, in, in, in the book, and when I sold the book to the, the New York publisher that published it, they they thought that the um, what I had presented to them was sort of like the second part of the book. They still wanted um, another uh, portion of the book prior to when the the, the action actually got started in the story, uh, and that pushed the sex scene back, you know, uh, from about page thirty to about page ninety. And so I actually, I had wanted, I thought people would would get engaged by the sex scene. It's erotic, and it's kind of funny, I hope. Um, And I wanted it to come earlier, and that was coming later. So I actually have an author's note, you know, just before the the text starts for the book. It says, author's note. And the author's note reads something like, uh, the dirtiest scene in this book uh, starts on page 97 or something, (laughs) something like that. Um, and, you know, it was sort of a, a, a tribute to that era. In, in those days, the uh, late 50s, the mid and late 50s, when the book is set, um, people would uh, pass around naughty novels like Peyton Place, for example. Um, and the, uh, the dirty sections, the naughty sections, the sexual descriptions were very dog-eared, you know, you could find them very quickly. Everybody wanted to read those naughty, naughty sections. So I thought it was sort of appropriate to, um, uh, you know, uh, in, include that. If people wanted to skip the text, they could just go to the... Uh, just go to the front. dirty stuff. Perhaps many people do just that, you know, and ignore the rest of the book. But the long-winded answer to your question, yeah, there was. Uh, um, uh, my work... Uh, uh, my, my screenplays and my novels uh, do have some sections that are uh, certainly graphically erotic, I would say. I, I ask because, um, as I recall, you um, there are a number of elements that you very much uh, discuss in your classes, and one of them being sex and violence in storytelling and how mm-hmm. important that is. Why is sex and violence important in story? Well, uh, for the same uh, the, the for the same reason, story you know that movies are in and and dramatic narratives are important. They're safe places to kind of live out the emotion uh, that we uh, we have in the uh, you know in unsafe places. And so we're kind of like um, that is to say, the safe place is the movie theater, the unsafe place is the world outside the movie theater. 
And I think by training uh, our emotions, experiencing extreme emotions, be they fear, be they, be they uh, jealousy, be they eroticism, um, desire, uh, you know, compulsion, obsession, and so on, to feel that in a safe place lets us deal with it more successfully in an unsafe place. And uh, as you know from having endured my lectures and read my books, I believe that the earliest movie theaters are the, the caves, you know, in um, Lescaux and... Uh, uh, more, uh, where else uh, in in France, where they where they have these these famous cave paintings of the hunters uh, and uh, the antelopes that they hunt and so on? I think they were those are the first movie theaters. They were really training in there to deal with the fear that they would experience uh, when um, these uh, animals, uh, you know, came at them as they were trying to slay them. You know, for their protein, for the meat, for the uh, skins that they used for clothing and for shelter and and so on. Uh, they were rehearsing for uh, real life, and I think it's uh, that's really what goes on in, the, in movie theaters today. You know, uh, back then the great danger was being um, eaten, uh, mauled by a uh, an antelope that you were trying to hunt, yes. you know, that you were, were trying to capture, and that's what the so-called movies were about. What are we? What, what are the big worries today? What are, you know? What's the the big worry today? Not counting the the, the situation in Washington. Um, the, uh, the the big worries today are, I mean, what's what's you know, what are you afraid of? Well, people are afraid of disease. We're afraid of crime. Um, what's the single most dangerous thing you'll do today? It'll be to drive in an automobile. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm I fly without any question, but I'm always afraid to fly, and yet I calm myself by realizing that the most dangerous part of this flight is the, the taxi to the airport and the taxi from the sure. from the airport. So what do we see in movies? We see car crashes and chases and stuff like that. In other words, the, the movies reflect stuff from our real lives that we're worried about, and they help us kind of deal with them in our, in our real lives by letting us rehearse for that. So what, um, how did you get to, I mean, how did you begin? Where, in other words, where did you get your your first inspiration? What brought you to becoming a writer in the first place? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I actually had um, gotten a master's degree at Syracuse University in uh, television and uh, radio. Is that in the Newhouse um, School? Is and that... I was going to continue there at the Newhouse School of Communications at Syracuse University. I was going to continue there for a Ph.D. Um, in a, as close to film as they had, which was something like instructional communications in the education school. Uh, and I had a few weeks to kill, and I uh, had never been west of Cleveland, so I got in my VW Beetle with a pal of mine, and we drove out in just three days to Los Angeles. And I um, hung around and saw the West Coast, went to, and, uh, went to Tijuana and saw a bullfight, and went to San Francisco and saw hippies, and everything in between, and um, was getting ready to, to to return to New York when I decided to just check out the UCLA and the USC film schools, uh, and I decided at the last minute that I would go to USC instead of going back to Syrac Syracuse. It was a major turning point in my life. I had never really taken a risk or reached or stretched or done anything that wasn't uh, safe, and I thought I should really do that. It just made no sense to, if I wanted to write for film and learn about film to go to Syrac Syracuse, New York, when I could be in, uh, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles. Sure. Um, and so I uh, enrolled at the very last moment, uh, uh, you know, at, at, at USC. And at USC, I, I fell into the class of Erwin R. Blacker, the legendary screenwriting educator. He now, um, long deceased, uh, a gruff, uh, sweetly belligerent sort of a guy. He really had a very soft heart, but he, he had this kind of tough demeanor. And um, he, it was is, in his he is he is he is legendary. Him. There's no question. Yes, indeed, indeed. George and and Melius and everybody studied with with the Blacker. And in that first class, I remember uh, he, uh, um, he I had some lame notion about what I was going to write, and he said, "You kids, you, you you're so young, you haven't done anything, you haven't had any experience, hasn't anything happened to you." ever in your life. I said, well, actually, last summer, and I described to him what had happened uh, when I was working at, in Project Head Start, the pilot Project Head Start, which was a Lyndon Johnson War on Poverty uh, program for preschool education in the uh, ghettos. I was in um, East Harlem in Manhattan, 
when a social worker was murdered by um, some of his uh, charges, and uh, I suggested that to Blacker, and he said, that's what I should write about. And so I did, and um, it's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier. It's a script uh, that looks like what it is. It's a first effort. I would never show that to anybody today as a sample of my craft, and I never did sell it, but it got me top representation, and it won me a, a, um, a job at uh, at Universal with a uh, parking place next to Paul Newman and a an office and an absurdly generous salary with my door with my name on the door <laughs> and uh, the, uni- the university providing a I'm sorry the the uh, studio Universal providing a, a a typewriter even. I wonder if your listeners know what a typewriter is. Um, um, some of them will not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, somebody walked. I keep a typewriter in my office at UCLA because sometimes it's faster to address an envelope. Uh, my printer sometimes eats the envelope when you try to set it. To I understand the, the problem. I understand. It's, and it seals the, the envelope, and you can't get the letter into it. So sometimes I just type the envelope, uh, type the address on the envelope, and I was doing that. Some months ago, when a student happened to walk by the the office, the door was open, and he saw me typing, and he said, "What's that?" And I said, "You've never seen one of these." <laughs> he said, "No." So I I told him it's a. Uh, I heard myself tell him that it's a desk, it's a user powered desktop, <laughs> and uh, I showed him how it worked and so on, and he, he looked it over and he said, "My God, it prints as it goes!" You know, like he thought that was a a breakthrough that one day all computers will will print as they go like typewriters did so um so, so uh, once again though that job at universal uh, uh, all came about as a result of a uh, screenplay uh, you know that i never did sell to this day i haven't i haven't sold it so it's a good example of the kind of rewards that can flow from the script that does not sell so let me ask you talking about school um there has been of late some uh, both political and, and other influences to say that uh, education, uh, higher education is not a necessity and we should um, sort of downplay higher education in our society. Why? T- really? Well, yes, it's been out there for uh, you know, uh-huh. a couple of years now. My, my question is, what advantages does a student have or a person have going to film school and learning as opposed to just going and doing it? What are the advantages? Well, I'm reminded of, of uh, um, one, there's a lot of hostility towards, towards screenwriting education among screenwriters yes. and, and the, the Writers Guild, uh, to which I've uh, belonged now for scores of years. Um, they, uh, and I, I was at an event where um, it was actually the uh, Guild Craft Conference up at Lake Arrowhead in the local mountains here, and uh, a speaker got up in front of me, a burned-out, used-to-be TV writer, who uh, was in terrible physical shape. He, he'd become morbidly obese. He clearly was, his life was going south. Uh, he was no longer getting writing jobs and just complaining about, uh, you know, the cruel, cruel industry. And he said that the writing programs like our own at UCLA, they're just hoaxes. Uh, that, uh, like you're indicating, people are saying in society today about higher education. They, he said that the books on screenwriting are also, um, you know, just scams. You can't learn how to write a screenplay by reading a book about it any more than you can learn how to swim by reading a book about it. You just got to get in and do it, you know. And he also said that the um, the the uh, uh, weekend seminars, of which I've given, you know, a hundred over the years, I'm sure that are very popular, uh, you know, out there in society, that those also were just uh, hoaxes, um, just a, uh, a scheme to steal people's money. You couldn't learn anything on a weekend like that. Uh, he said all of that. I, when, I, when I came on, I, I reviewed what he had said. I hear stuff like that all the time. Just like you're saying, people are saying, forget education, forget, uh, uh, you know, film school, just go and, go and, go and do it. When I hear stuff like, like that, uh, I am reminded. Uh, are we still on? We're, we're still on. I, when I when I hear stuff like that, I'm reminded of an expression my my grandmother used to use. She was a deeply religious woman, um, Eastern European spiritual woman. She used to say, "Why don't you go fuck yourself?" <laughs> I mean, um, really, it's pretty insulting, uh, you know, for somebody to to 
say uh, what you say people are saying, that uh, education is, is, is a waste. Uh, the fact of the matter is nothing better could happen to a student who wants to, to, to anybody who wants to become a screenwriter, professional screenwriter, than to come to our program at UCLA. And I'm not recruiting people for it. This is not an advertisement. We have many, many times as many people applying as we're able to admit. Um, and uh, I also believe no one should ever be uh, encouraged to, to be a writer, and nobody should be encouraged to come to UCLA. Anybody who needs to be encouraged, uh, you know, uh, lacks the the um, motivation, uh, the energy that it takes, uh, you know, down down the line. So please don't misunderstand me. Anybody who's hearing us, uh, this is not an attempt to, to to encourage people to apply. But nothing better could happen to to uh, writers than to get into our program. Um, the, uh, but what are the advantages, Richard? Well, tell, tell me what what. Uh, well, I, course, the, I know what the they are. The advantages is to is is to is, is the learning. I'm sorry, you were, I cut you off. You were it, saying I was saying I know what the advantages are because I've been there and mm-hmm. done it. And, I, and and but I would like our listeners to understand sure. how how a an advanced education in this craft is. You know what does it do for you? How does it how does it advantage you? Well, first I'll tell you the least important part of it. So many people think it's the most important part of it, and it is a part of it, even if it's the least important part. And that is the connections that you make, the networking. I'm still working with people that I met at USC. I just finished a project with a, 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 a fellow that I uh, have been socially involved with, and his family, my family, we're, we're, we're close. Uh, and we've been close professionally. We started making industrial films uh, for Universal, uh, you know, nearly half a century ago, Saints Preserve Us. Um, you will uh, meet a lot of people um, who are going to become quite successful. You'll form relationships, and, and that will carry you on into a professional career. I say that's the least important part of it because that part of it is useless and worthless if you don't have the, the goods, if you don't have really, really good material. Of course. It's so hard to have good material. It's so hard to be a good writer It takes because it takes so much time and it requires so much patience. Um, that people love to blame anything else, you know, for uh, uh, issues that they're having with, with the finding work, with their career. And, and so you can talk about connections. I just spoke to a guy, I met a guy yesterday who was going to be in town until the end of next week, and he has a script that I had read. He'd given me to read. Uh, this is not a, a UCLA student, but someone from the outside. I'd read this script uh, in an earlier form and given him some... Uh, very, very superficial notes on it. He'd rewritten it, and now he wanted to show it in Hollywood. He, he wanted to make connections now when he's here in Hollywood, and he showed up at my office at UCLA, and I took a look at the script, and I could see that it was vastly improved, uh, but it still wasn't ready. You could see right on the first page a, a huge overwritten uh, block, big, multi-lined block of description just swarming uh, with uh, what producers call that black stuff, the ink you know, on the, on the page. Um, describing, um, you know, uh, quite a lot of material that just wasn't necessary, that was all for mood and tone and texture and stuff like that. But uh, So the script wasn't ready. You could see that on the first page. Uh, and he had come to me to ask for contacts. Who should he see? Who be the writer? He said, well, what? <laughs> you shouldn't show this now. You, you know, uh, what's the point of these contacts in showing it if the material's not really ready? And I showed him why I thought the material wasn't ready and why he would get the uh, you know, responses that he was going to get, uh, you know, in my estimation. And um, uh, he didn't want to hear that. He, he's there in town. He's ready to meet with people who wants to do that. And my point is it's so much easier to do that than it is to do what writers have to do, which is, you know too well, sit alone in a room and, and try to invent stuff that's worthy of the time and attention and consideration, not to mention, you know, $15 or $20 that it costs now to get into a fancy-ass theater, you know, if it's an IMAX or a, a 3D presentation of some big tentpole film. Um, the uh, uh, w- Once again, the, the, the trick is to um, ha- have good material. If you have good material, it'll find its way. There's something rare, I have to tell you. I mean, we both know this is true, and anybody who spent a little time uh, struggling with screenwriting at, in any corner of its uh, uh, world knows uh, that um, it's unusual to open a script and read the first part of the first page and actually want to finish that page. Sure. Actually get engaged by it. 
and rarer still to get down to the bottom of that page and actually to want to want to turn the page and see what happens after that. Uh, that is a tall order all by itself, but it's not all by itself. You have to keep that up throughout the script. You know, a script should be about 100 pages now, ballpark, or even a little shorter, certainly not much longer. And to keep that up for uh, 100 pages, that is simply the hardest thing, uh, um, you know, in the in the universe to do. I mean, it's easier to run to Glendale and back, you know, on your feet, even with my bad back, than to sit alone in a room and, and try to invent characters and and situations and dialogue that they speak and conflicts and the whole superstructure that constitutes story, that's a really hard thing to do. But that's what you have to do, and I'll say it again, that's why they pay so much when they pay it all. Indeed. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you've got... Um, writers frequently will complain of a thing called writer's block. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you've had any number of students over time complain of writer's block to you. And I don't know whether you've ever had it or not, but what do you, can you give any advice on, on how to beat writer's block? Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, I'm, I'm very much taken with a book I highly recommend. It's just a pamphlet, really. And I wonder if you've heard of it. Uh, it's, it's a play on the art of war. It's called The War of Art. Oh, Stephen Pressfield. Stephen Pressfield. I think Pressfield is just a genius. I'm going to figure out a way to meet, meet the guy. He tells two quick stories that come to mind about writer's block. One is somebody was asking uh, Evelyn Waugh, the, the famous uh, legendary British writer, yes. whether or not he, uh, whether he, he writes only when he's inspired. He suddenly gets inspired and his muse visits him and he sits down and he writes or does he um, you know write on a regular basis keep a regular schedule and he said uh, Waugh said he only writes when he feels the inspiration fortunately however he feels inspired every morning at nine o'clock when he sits down at his <laughs> at his writing table you know um, Pressfield also says uh, he says it's easy to write it's just hard to sit down to write uh, if you're a writer, yeah, you, you have a special in, insight uh, into that. I don't believe there's any such thing. I'll say two things about uh, writer's block. One, I don't think there's any such thing as writer's block. Two, there is only writer's block. And by that, what I mean is uh, we're always blocked all the time. Nobody wants to write. We love having written. But uh, actually writing is always, always a challenge, <clears throat> always, always a uh, uh a, a struggle, not only for new writers, but uh, for experienced writers, for superstars, high-earning writers. Nobody knows more writers than I do. I've I've worked with so many writers, so uh, intimately over so many years. Um, and there's not one of them who um, who uh, you know uh, uh, finds it easy, um, who does not feel blocked much of the time. You have to just go forward anyway. And what will happen is what we were talking about earlier. You'll you'll suddenly find out that that uh, you lost consciousness of time about uh, you know two and a half hours ago. Uh, you suddenly found yourself in it, and uh, you, you kind of found your story. I believe it's not so much about construction as it is about uh, discovery, taking away rather than putting on. You discover, taking the cover off something that's that's already there. I never knew a writer who wasn't surprised by um, twists and turns that the story seemed to take, by lines of dialogue that, that uh, seemed to just uh, arise spontaneously out of her characters. Um, you know, it's funny, I, was, I had Neil Simon uh, come to class some years ago to talk about writing comedy. Uh, I mean, having Neil Simon in a class uh, you know, screenwriting class talk about comedy. That's like being in seminary and having a lecture from the Lord. You know, of course, the Lord will be doing a Q and A in room nine. You know, at uh, four thirty. <laughs> Dress appropriately. Uh, and I remember um, somebody asked Mr. Simon um, uh, if he laughs at his own jokes, and Neil said, uh, "Sure, I do. The first time I hear them, I think that's a tremendously insightful line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as if." somebody tells him these jokes um there is something mysterious about writing i've never known a writer who who didn't understand that aspect of writing but it might elude people who aren't actual practitioners who don't actually uh, actually write 
the trick is not in building a story and adding things on. It's about taking stuff away and finding the story that's already there, very much in the way that Michelangelo um, sculpted yeah. the famous David that stands in Florence. Um, he says that uh, you know his his um, workmen went to Carraro, where his favorite quarry was, and they dug out this big block of marble from which he would uh, sculpt the, the David, and they brought it to his studio, and he set it up there, got ready to go to work, and he could see the David there inside that block. And all he needed to do, he says, was just take away those parts that weren't sure. David, you know. Sure, sure. And I, there was the statue, was already there, you know. Of course, knowing what to take away is where the money is, that's where the genius is. I, but it is, again, a taking away process, not an adding on process, but a uh, taking away process that leads to efficiency economy, using a little language to say a lot, rather than the other way around. I, I totally agree. I, I also tell my students that the the secret formula to writing success is ass liberally applied to chair. Yes, indeed. Uh, ass to chair and, key, and and fingers to keys. Indeed. Or if you're working crayon, you know, fist wrapped around crayon, <laughs> whatever it is that you use. But it really is, you know, ass to chair, uh, fingers to keys. Really, what we're talking about here, Steve, is time. Time. Uh, and it's funny, I, I regard myself as so fortunate in this life. The great, great good fortune of my life right now at this red hot moment is a new grandchild my first granddaughter oh, congratulations thank you just a couple of weeks weeks old you know and what is um you know what is love uh, writers struggle with with defining love and i can't define it i'm not even going to try but i can tell you what a measure of the measure of love is it's time how much time will you spend with it with a child. Interesting. Uh, how much time will you, do you love your partner? Uh, how much time will you spend with her or him? Um, you know, what is your, your time engagement with that, with that particular, that's the measure of love. And likewise, uh, in a, uh, writing a screenplay or a novel, um, or having a, uh, career as a writer, it's a question of how much time you're willing to, uh, put into this. And, uh, there are no shortcuts uh, it's all about uh, devoting yourself to do, to that and and doing it every day, struggling with the resistance that Pressfield talks about eloquently in uh, the War of Art, uh, and sticking with it and always, always, always being dissatisfied. Uh, I think the truest thing ever said in my lifetime was, uh, "The Rolling Stones can't get no da 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 satisfaction." I never knew an artist was really pleased with the way everything came out. No, nope, never. Um, never, 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 never. You, uh, you know, one of my sayings, and it's not original with me, it actually comes from Mark McCormick, who wrote a wonderful book for businessmen and women about, uh, oh, 30 years ago. It was, it was a big bestseller called The uh, What They Don't Teach You in the Harvard uh, Business School. Right. Um, and uh, he was saying, um, you know, it's sort of street wisdom, street savvy for CEOs is what the book is about. But it's really useful advice in, in life in general, in the university and and so on. One, one of his rules is don't let excellent get in the way of good. <laughs> I think that's really useful that's for writers. Excellent. So you get something, it's not quite, you'll never really be pleased with it with the way it came out. What I urge writers to do very quietly when it's just writers talking is is try to get to that stage. The highest stage you should ever get to is that you're not ashamed of what you wrote. There's something kind of humbling about it. You know, my sister is an actor, and she's very, very well known, Jessica. Uh, she's about Jessica to come Walter. Her out. She lives in New York. Her husband is also a very famous actor, Ron Liebman. They mm -hmm. both won uh, Emmys. Ron won the Tony for uh, uh, Tony Kushner's timeless play, um, Angels, Angels in America, America, where he, uh, on Broadway, Ron played uh, Roy Cohn. They were, the two of them were, um, well, as she's coming out, I started to say, they're going to do four, um, uh, they're going to do another um, run of Arrested Development, where she plays Lucille Bluth. Yes. Like this, uh, and uh, Ronnie and Jess, some years ago, were um, on... Uh, uh, starring together in a Neil Simon play it was called Rumors about 30 years ago on Broadway and I came to New York to, uh, and among other things I, I went to see the play and I, I saw them just before the performance 
And I said, now this is the uh, 87th performance. You're not nervous when you go out there. And they said, the day we're not nervous when we go out there is the day we quit the show. Mm-hmm. You want to be, you don't, you want to be a, a little nervous. You want to be, um, well, you don't want to be a supremely confident. You know, tomorrow I'm going to appear at the Pitch Fest in Burbank. I'll be talking about character. Uh, three rules for character, I think, is this, the uh, the subject. Um, what are they? I'm going to do an hour and a half. Steve, you know me. I've I've given a thousand lectures. Yeah. I'm a trained actor. I am a, a very experienced public speaker. Uh, I did a couple of dozen appearances on the O'Reilly Factor, if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, adios, Bill. <laughs> adios. Um, I'm not <laughs> terribly sorry to see him taken off the show. I was kind of the uh, I had my 15 minutes of fame, and I was the uh, uh, kind of the, um, the house lib at Fox News. It felt like, and um, so I've done a zillion of these things on TV and and in classrooms and uh, at, at lectures all around the world. I've never, ever gone out there without being nervous, never, ever launched even just a little seminar at UCLA without being uh, nervous about it. So people, writers should stop trying to get used to it. They should stop trying to feel good while they're working. Um, They should uh, just see themselves as working women and men trying to get the job done um, as least awful (laughs) as they can make it. And then let all your, pre- your your surprises be pleasant ones, you know. Um, I really think there is something to be said for expecting the worst. And in that way, you can guarantee that, that all of your surprises will be pleasant ones. You know, what really counts in, in dramatic narratives is feeling. Um, movies, television shows, plays, novels, all art, it's really about feeling. It's about emotion. If you actually, uh, you know, I was preaching, believe it or not, I was, uh, a few years ago, I was um, invited to lecture at a, uh, an evangelical Christian conference in Chicago, 500 pastors from all across the nation. Now, what did they want with a Jew like me? And the answer is that it was all about um, narrative in Scripture. If you read uh, Scripture, if you read the Old Testament, you read the Christian Bible, you read the you, you read Quran, it's all stories. I mean, there is commentary and observation but it's mainly about storytelling. Sure it is. It's all storytelling. And um, those stories are not comforting stories. They are, uh, you know, not uplifting stories. They're really perverse and, and bloody and and and, um, and ugly. Uh, and I remember telling the preachers that if you want to keep your parishioners in the church, even after they leave the church, that is to say, if you want them to be hefting and weighing and considering and reconsidering the sermon that you gave, Sunday morning, you do not you do not need to make them feel good. You just need to make them feel. Wow. And likewise, if you um, uh, are writing a movie, you do not need to to make your audience feel good. Uh, you know, one of the myths about um, Hollywood and about American film and about American audience is that uh, they all need to be tied up neatly at the end, a little unrealistically. Uh, you know, idealized everything neat and worked out and happy at the end. Oh, you mean like Chinatown? Well, exactly. The Godfather, Godfather. Uh, Thelma Louise. Exactly. Uh, you name it. It's just a hoax. Most of most of the successful stuff ends up Casablanca. You know, in tragedy and despair. The <laughs> point is that you don't have to make people feel good. You just have to provoke them, disturb them, upset them, even offend them. I'd rather be offended uh, than than be bored. You know, coming out of a, uh, a well, movie that, theater. That's the kiss of death. So the reason I mention this is that people who come to this enterprise, people like, for example, you and I. But also, I should say, like you and me, uh, I am a writer uh, uh, and a writing educator. <laughs> Got to get the English um, right. The uh, uh, people like like you and me, we are people who feel things intensely. We are passionate people. I like to think that uh, people listening to this podcast are, if they are writers, then they are passionate uh, people, and that means that they are. And, and that job, of course, is to share that passion, to communicate that passion, to get audiences passionate. Uh, but what it also means is that we, since we feel our passion, we feel our feelings so strongly, um, we need to uh, protect ourselves against them because we're going to feel, I hope, from time to time, great ecstasy, great joy, the way I feel about my, my little granddaughter, Maggie, and her big, big brother, he's almost three, the light of our lives, Cooper. Uh, we, uh, 
you know, we 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 feel wonderful uh, uh, happiness regarding uh, such events, but we also, you know, such enterprises. But we we also feel the opposite of that. Nobody gets away without it, without loss, without betrayal, without frustration, without disappointment. And we mustn't. For, and that happens to writers when they submit screenplays and don't get the responses uh, that they hoped for. Well, they do get the responses that they hope for, but then it doesn't uh, move any further than that, uh, or it, or it moves further than that, um, but only reaches the next station of disappointment. I love to say that in Hollywood, uh, every success just raises you to the next level of opportunity for frustration. Hmm. You know, uh, you have to be able to deal with that, and the way to deal with that, to protect yourself from that, is to have reduced expectations, and when things go well. Uh, to be, uh, you know, exceptionally pleased by that, but also to be a little, little bit surprised uh, by that, and not to require that because that'll stop you cold. Uh, there's nobody who constantly finds satisfaction in her or his art. Yeah, that's a, that's absolutely. I can vouch for that myself. It's very hard for the artist to be in love with their own work. You can love what you're doing while you're doing it, but then after the fact, it's up to others to decide whether it's any good or not or whether it was worthwhile. I agree completely. As a matter of fact, all of the writers I know, they look back, you compliment the work that they did. I was just talking to a writer-director yesterday who was a graduate of our program, and I was complimenting a particular film of hers that's my favorite, and she kind of like rolled her eyes and said, yeah, well, those were my training wheels, you know, uh, she thinks she's come a long way since then, and indeed she has, but that work uh, is still very, very meritorious, is very wonderful, but I think it's, it's to her credit that she's not that wild about it. She's not reviewing it and going over sure. it again and again and again, always struggling to, to, uh, uh, to do better. Well, we have been speaking for the last, or I've been speaking for the last hour or so with the astonishing Richard Walter, who I you know, I hold in high, you know, esteem because he's, you know, everything that I teach Richard, whether you know it or not, your lessons are being passed down through people like me who are teaching the next generation as well. And um, we're coming toward the end of our show today. And what I'd, I'd like to know, we've heard the lots of... The first thing I have to say is thank you, thank you. I'm only going to let you go on for a few <laughs> days like that. So I, I do appreciate those generations. <laughs> Uh, kind words, Steve. I really, really do thank you. And believe you. me, if you didn't stop me, I'd go on for days and days. So, uh, uh, he... Don't tempt me now. Don't tempt me. <laughs> uh, do, we've heard lots of amazing uh, bits of advice today. I'm wondering if there is one overarching bit of advice or a tip that you would like to leave our listeners with. Sure. Actually, I, I can't resist giving, giving two. One is sort of general and one is more concrete. The more concrete one first is... Uh, there can be nothing in a piece of uh, art that doesn't serve that art. Our art is narrative, dramatic narrative. That means storytelling. So every single detail in your in your screenplay must serve story. You should be and remember, a screenplay is just two kinds of information: it's stuff you see, it's stuff you hear. And uh, that when I say you, I mean the audience. And every single one of those sights and sounds has to move the story forward palpably. Uh, measurably, identifiably. If you can do that throughout, you know, for a couple of hours, a hundred minutes, uh, you will succeed. The reason people don't do that is it just takes so much time to uh, to do that. It means putting, throwing in a lot of stuff, and then throwing out a lot of stuff. That's the process. You yes. have to uh, tolerate all of that. But if I were going to say a uh, a, a more uh, global kind of a kind of a piece of advice for writers, it would be this: go with your gut. Go with your gut. They say the, uh, I mean, every time, go with your gut, go with your feelings. We already talked about how it's all about feelings. Um, there's an expression we, we've all heard. Uh, there's a song about it, beware my foolish heart. But the truth is the heart is smart. It's the head that's stupid. It, the head can, uh, you know, rationalize and, and uh, calculate and um, sort of work things out in a way that seems on the surface to be okay, but you know underneath, you know in your heart that it's not right, it just doesn't feel right, and it's not so much the heart, I think, as it is the belly and, and even, even the groin. You just know that something is wrong, or you know that something is right. I was talking to a writer the other day, I was working, we are at the end of our academic year now, the end of our spring quarter, and I just finished up my meetings with all of my writers, and there's one writer there, she's a writer-director, 
And I said to her, uh, you know, I can pick apart this whole thing, this whole opening page. You look about the language here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't seem necessary, but it works. It just works. I can't tell you why it works, but don't let nobody fuck with your voice, yeah. is what I told her. Yeah. Just keep doing what you're doing, um, and don't try to figure it out or understand it in an intellectual way. Uh, once again, it's it's not about um, understanding. It, it, it's really about feeling. It's not about the head. It's about the heart. I would say to writers, uh, read my books and learn all the rules and then throw them away and go with your gut. Well, that is uh, exceptionally wise advice. And the, you know, and the proof of the pudding there is just how many people have gone out and made good off of your lesson. So I thank you so much for being with us today on Story Beat, Richard. This has been a, a more than a great treat. This has been a true honor. Well, Steve, I am honored, uh, and I am the lucky one to cross paths with souls of light like you. I really, really am, and I thank you most kindly. You know where to reach me uh, when, uh, when you need me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Today's Story Beat tip. Truthfully, not much has changed in storytelling since Aristotle detailed the fundamentals that we follow to this day. Studying Aristotle's poetics, written 2,700 years ago, can be instructive. Aristotle is often credited with describing a three-act structure. The only problem with this claim is that he never wrote anything about three acts. Instead, Aristotle detailed the concept of stories having a beginning, a middle, and an end, not three acts. Movies, unlike plays, don't have actual act breaks. Stories flow contiguously from beginning to end. I prefer to think of motion picture stories as having three major movements, each with a special purpose related to the whole. I can't think of a way to tell a worthy story without all three movements. In brief, Aristotle states that the beginning ought to start as late as possible, not before the story begins. The middle is that which follows the beginning, which is followed by the end, which should not conclude after the story ends. That seems all too obvious, doesn't it? Simple. But the challenge is in finding a story's perfect beginning, following that with the grueling stretch of the always troubling and difficult to sustain middle, and then tying up the whole thing with a powerful ending that stops at the perfect moment. Getting that right takes skill, talent, a lot of hard work, and more than a little good fortune. If you haven't already done so, I highly urge you to read Aristotle's Poetics. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.